good evening, everyone, um, or good morning to anyone who is joining us from the other side of the world. Uh, my name is Courtney Dogger, and I'm the president of Network 2020. It's a real pleasure today to welcome you to a panel discussion on um, uh, the economic impacts of the coronavirus on North Korea um, and you know, separating fact from fiction when it comes to COVID-19 in North Korea. We have a really terrific panel today. Um, and with the part with the permission of our um, of our panelists, I I will give you their bios, but not in full. Um, just just so you all know, there is a lot more that they've done than I will um, read to you tonight. Um, you know, please do check out their backgrounds because it's all quite impressive. So I'll start with our moderator, who's Keith Luce. He is the executive director of the National Committee on North Korea, and previously he was the senior East Asia policy advisor for. Chairman and later ranking uh, member Senator Richard Lugar at the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee from 2003 to 2013. And he also served as staff director for Mr. Lugar um, on the Senate Agriculture Committee. Um, and while he was there, he made the first of what eventually became five trips to North Korea. Um, he is widely traveled throughout Asia. And uh, just to give you a sense of um, how his work is valued. He uh, has been presented the Vietnam Medal of Friendship by uh, Vietnam's president uh, in, for active contributions to the process of normalization and development of the US-Vietnam relationship. He also received the Philippine Legion of Honor Award from President Aquino for assisting Sen Senator Lugar's efforts to foster relations between the US and the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Um, and he has also received an award for his work uh, for service to the U.S.-Japan alliance. So he uh, is, is very well versed in the region and is recognized for that. Um, shifting to Troy Stangaron, he is the senior director and fellow at the Korea Economic Institute. He, oversee he oversees the Institute's trade and economic related initiatives, as well as the Institute's relations with Capitol Hill and Washington DC trade community. And as part of his broader portfolio, he serves as the editor for KEI's, uh, the Institute's flagship publication, Korea's Economy, and oversees their blog. Um, he has written extensively, um, basically any publication that you've heard of that, uh, that is in, uh, widely published in the US, as well as those abroad as well. Um, he, uh, there was, uh, he has also worked on Capit um, Capitol Hill on issues relating to foreign affairs and trade. Um, so he um, is very well versed on the economic side of things. And then we have Dr. Ki Park, who is the director of the North Korea program at the Korean American Medical Association. And since 2007, he has visited North Korea over 20 times to support the North Korean doctors, with his last visit being in November of 2019. He is a member of the faculty at Harvard Medical School, where his academic interests include the complex geopolitical factors influencing health in North Korea and the relationships between international security, health and human rights and health diplomacy. Um, so I'm going to cut it off there, um, but I think the whole panel is terrific. Um, at any point, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box, um, or if you'd like, you can raise your hand and we'll call on you when it comes time to the Q&A portion. Um, so with that, I am going to mute myself and turn it over to Keith for what looks to be an excellent discussion. Courtney, thank you for that introduction. It's a privilege uh, to be with you tonight on behalf of the National Committee on North Korea, uh, along with my uh, two colleagues and friends, uh, Dr. Keith Park and, and Troy Stangerum from KEI. Um, as we talk about North Korea, uh, and fact or fiction in terms of not only COVID-19, but also as relates to U.S. policy in North Korea. Uh, there are initially three points that I would like to share, and then I will go to uh, Key and to Troy to obtain their initial input as well before I start asking questions uh, among, uh, between them. Uh, first, uh, I would suggest that there have been three statements that have been at the core of U.S. policy development regarding North Korea through the years. Uh, statement number one, uh, the North Korean government cannot survive. It will collapse. Uh, that, of course, has proven to be fiction. Uh, but this particular uh, 
statement is one that for a number of administrations, as well as uh, members of Congress through the years, has, has been an important point of reference. The thought that the country won't be around, therefore we don't need to pay a lot of attention, we can just go on to other things. Statement number two, North Korea is isolated. It's a hermit kingdom sealed off from the rest of the world. Well, that is fiction as well. Uh, North Korea has diplomatic relations with over 160 countries. In 2017, China issued over 200,000 visas for North Koreans to visit. Um, also, uh, over 3,000 North Koreans have been trained by Chosen Exchange from Singapore uh, on how to become an entrepreneur, how to get into business, how to make money. These North Koreans have been trained in Singapore. They've been trained in Vietnam, as well as in Pyongyang. In addition, as we are all aware from uh, the coverage this topic receives, there have been about 100,000 North Koreans working in other countries in recent years, uh, a number of countries. And as these North Korean workers were out of their country, uh, they also had opportunity, many of them, not all, but many of them did have opportunity uh, to view South Korean videos um, along the way. Finally, statement number three, uh, a statement that I recall from my time on the Hill and, and since my time in Congress, a statement that has repeatedly been made by Republicans, by Democrats, by leaders and administrations, by leaders in the Congress, and the statement is, North Korea will never be allowed to develop nuclear weapons. Well, we know that that is fiction in terms of that statement. Uh, the fact of the matter is that North Korea's weapons of mass destruction capabilities, biological, chemical, nuclear, all continue to develop. And um, this, is, this is before you even get into uh, the cyber area. And of course, uh, North Korea reportedly now has the capability of launching an ICBM, which could uh, hit an American city. So uh, just as a starter, I share those three uh, points uh, as background for our conversation tonight. Um, but now I'd like to uh, turn to uh, first to Troy and then to Key, to Dr. Park, uh, for their initial introductory statements and uh, anything they'd like to add on the fact and fiction uh, point. Troy? Well, Courtney, thank you for having me, Keith uh, Key. It's great to be here with you uh, this evening. Um, you know, I think one of the great fictions is that we know what's going on in North Korea. And we had a really good example of that, you know, here in the last few weeks with Kim Jong-un to where there's all kinds of rumors and a lot of certainty to where you had even North Korean defectors say, we're 99% certain that he's dead. Um, we now know that that's not true. But, you know, if you go even beyond sort of, you know, these types of rumors that come out, um, some of the things that I think we often take as fact about North Korea on the economic side tend to not be true as well. Um, one, um, Keith mentioned the overseas laborers. Um, it's often said that they earned about $2 billion a year for North Korea. If you look at the data about the number of people that we believe are working overseas, roughly what the median wage is in these countries. Um, in essence, they would be making more than the average work in these countries, and actually they end up making more than the average American makes. Um, so it's fairly clear that this is a number that is too high. Um, you know, the Trump administration has used a number of 500 million. That's probably much closer, but I keep seeing the $2 billion number float out, and it's just clearly a fictional number at the end of the day. Um, what is a fact? A fact is, is that North Korea continues to trade. Um, it continues to be very adaptable. Um, we often say that you know sanctions have crippled North Korea, but if we look at the economy in North Korea uh, pre-COVID-19 and compare it with um, you know say Iran, which also faces sanctions, you can see that North Korea has done a much better job of adapting to the situation of managing to get around sanctions, either through smuggling or other activities to maintain at least the minimal level of economic activity that they engage in internationally and domestically. But just to sort of start off our conversation, you know, one of the things I'd like to share real quick is this uh, right here. It's North Korea's exports to China. 
And if you look at how sort of COVID-19 has impacted things, one of the issues that's come up is that North Korea, in a sense, has sealed its border. And data is very hard to come by with North Korea. Um, we have to, on trade, look at mirror statistics. You can often question whether those are accurate, and we might discuss that some more later. But what the mirror statistics tell us, if you look at North Korean exports to China, in essence, is that since you see right here at the end of January when uh, North Korea took trade has fallen off. And if you look at the March data here, that's actually only $616,000 uh, in exports. So, you know, a little bit more than half a million dollars. So it's actually, you know, trade has come to a stop. And if we look at the imports, um, they've also dropped dramatically dramatically as well. There's only 18 million in uh, March. And uh, with that, um, Keith. All right, thank you, Troy. Uh, Key Park, Dr. Park, your turn. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Courtney, thank you for inviting me to the panel. I'm really honored to be on the panel with uh, Keith and, and, and Troy. This is, uh, this is great. I think that, that the fact that we're talking and, and it's been some time trying to discern between what's fiction and what's, uh, what's fact is, is incredibly uh, valuable, you know, especially at, at this point. I mean, Troy talked about this, you know, the Kim Jong-un disappearing for a while, you know, the rumors are crazy. Um, and then, you know, the whole world was watching when, when he reappeared, right? And it, these, these have deadly implications because the intel we get from, from North Korea uh, is of varying quality, obviously. But the analysis is, it's, it's now I'm not even an intel person, I'm, I'm a physician by training. And just a simple analysis, uh, the, the degree of, uh, of lack of analysis, as you say, is astounding. I'll give you just uh, two, uh, two, two examples uh, on, on public health and COVID-19 uh, situation. So North Korea claims that they have no COVID-19 cases in their country. And you know, very quickly, you know, experts around the world say, oh, that's not true. We don't believe that they're just saying that. But if you just kind of dig a little bit and look at some of the measures that they have taken, uh, which was quite early, uh, drastic in some ways, and comprehensive and sealing it off its borders as early as in January 20 of this, of this year, even before they locked down Wuhan. You know, these measures are super uh, uh, effective, these non-medical countermeasures. And I think they did dodge the bullet. And, I, and, and so and the, the other question is, well, there's a huge border, this 900 mile border between China and North Korea and people go back and forth all the time. Yes, that's true, it's, it's very porous, but they did lock that down. Plus, if you look carefully at the numbers of COVID-19 cases in the two provinces that, that, that were adjacent to North Korea, there are 100 cases in one, 145 cases in the other, one or two deaths in each province. So if, you, know, you have to look at all these pieces of data, and you also have to look at the North Korea's uh, behavior, right? So one of the, uh, the clues that, 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 that we get uh, to the, that it gives us some, some uh, information about what they're thinking is that they've been relaxing some of their social uh, distancing measures. Some of the restrictions on, on domestic travel, they are now reopen some of the ports, the key ports for trade, uh, uh, the non post now reopen. So that means that they're feeling a little bit more comfortable. So I think, you know, before we reject their statements outright, we really have to look uh, a little bit more into you know, some of the circumstantial evidence and you have to triangu triangulate when you, you know, uh, look in North Korea. And I'll give you another, uh, one more example, which is uh, the fact that the North Korea has officially asked for help, uh, to help with COVID-19 response. This happened in uh, mid-February. And there are a lot of uh, uh, experts who come out and said, uh, said, look, they're asking for help. They're, they have cases inside. No, that's not true. <laughs> I'm a public health uh, specialist. And I can tell you that you have to do two things at the same time. One is prevent by blocking the border, sealing off the borders and, and, and mitigate the transmission. And they've been very su successful at that. But at the same time, they've asked for help and in, 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 in the medical countermeasures, which is treatment capacity and testing capacity. And that's perfectly rational. And just because they're asking for help to build up, you know, vent make it, you know, add more ventilators, doesn't mean that they have you know, cases inside. They know the threat is still there. So I think it's, uh, I'm super excited to have this panel today because there's so many more stories like this where we can dig a little bit deeper and get into a much better understanding about North Korea. Gee, thank you. And uh, your introductory remarks uh, really uh, can lead us down, uh, I think a very important path now. Uh, Troy, 
uh, you know, Dr. Park just outlined the fact that uh, Kim Jong-un probably saved lives by taking early action to shut down the border, uh, establish a quarantine measures, an anti-epidemic campaign, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, uh, as you and, and Key are aware, there are, there are also humanitarian consequences uh, to these actions. For example, uh, a few thousand containers had backed up on the China side uh, of the border. Un unable to move into North Korea. And once they got into North Korea, they would be subject uh, to a 14 day quarantine, even at that point. Well, that's just getting uh, seed and fertilizer, uh, humanitarian supplies from the UN and so on into North Korea. That was put on hold for quite a while. In addition to that, uh, in Pyongyang, the United Nations uh, has been uh, negotiating, UN officials in Pyongyang, to the best of their ability, negotiating with the North Koreans with the Ministry of Health, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, negotiating so that um, uh, the 30 day quarantine that's in place, right? For anyone that arrives in North Korea, that's, that is a difficult, uh, that's a difficult bar. If you're Frode Mooring, the resident coordinator of the UN, who's not been able to get back into North Korea, that's a difficult bar for uh, a number of the NGOs the European NGOs who have offices in the North, American NGOs who travel into the North. That's, that 30-day that quarantine is pretty difficult. And in addition, uh, the North Koreans are unwilling to allow the United Nations or those NGOs to go out into the countryside to, to monitor supplies as they finally come. So those are some of the humanitarian consequences. But I'd like for you to take what I just shared and what, what Key previously stated, talk to us about the uh, supply chain implications, if you would, please, uh, of this uh, very uh, direct action that North Korea took to, to protect country, right, to prevent uh, the entry of, of COVID-19, to prevent the spread. I understand that, but there are consequences. So in your mind, what are the potential consequences for the North Korean population as a whole, not just Pyongyang, but out in the countryside? What are the potential consequences based upon uh, these very uh, strong actions. Apologies, I muted myself. One of the things that we see is, you know, North Korea is essentially facing both a supply shock and a demand shock. And that's not surprising, you know, we're seeing that around the world. But when you think about the supply side, which is, you know, really to an extent what you're initially talking about here, Keith, um, you know, let's look at food. So when I went through the March trade data, one of the things that you see is it's not just a question, and you wouldn't be surprised if you see imports dropping drastically, but you have a situation to where rice and corn, for example, imports fell to zero. Um, now, there is a period or times where North Korea doesn't import rice or corn from China. That's not necessarily surprising, but you know, one of the things to you know, look at here is when we think about this, I've got, I pulled the data for the last um, few months of, uh, or sorry, the last few years of just by a quarterly basis. So we could look at this, you know, in a sort of more condensed fashion of cereal imports. So rice and corn. And when you look at that, what you see here is, is that, you know, there are these dips at the beginning of the year, but, you know, there had been sort of a slow trend early on, slightly increasing early in the year and it drops to zero. So I think, you know, the initial question here is, is will this continue to where you won't see these arches that come up each year? Now, at the same time, you have a situation to where food, uh, out in terms of like edible vegetables, uh, nuts and other things have also uh, seen their imports drop to essentially zero. Um, flour, sugar are the only kinds of things that really got through in March. So. Part of this will depend on what the food stores are in North Korea and how long uh, that lasts. Now, imports probably only play maybe five to 10% of a role in North Korean total food. There's not necessarily good data on this, but you're talking about something that is going to aggravate you know, the situation. So let's look at sort of then what North Korea can do domestically. You know, obviously it has its own agricultural industry. It has its own challenges, but you also see a drop in imports of fertilizer and plastic sheets that are used uh, in agriculture. So that's going to make it more difficult to grow crops domestically. So you're starting to see some of these impacts. Now, 
let's look at this on the other side. You know, what does this mean for like manufacturing, the things that North Korea is still able to produce? Um, you know, one of the things North Korea has been doing in the last year or two has been importing parts from China to make watches and then re-exporting those watches to, um, you know, uh, back to China for export perhaps to other places. Um, those exports have dropped as well. So what little sort of manufacturing you had, the inputs that go into those types of goods are now no longer accessible with the quarantine. Um, another way to look at this too is, you know, a lot of the goods that are sold in the markets, yes, a lot of the food is grown domestically and sold, but you have a lot of goods that come in through China, either legally or through smuggling. And, you know, what we've seen is, is that one, um, basically the North Koreans have cut off the smuggling to a large extent. I would never say anything is absolute, uh, but basically there have been warnings that people will be shot if they attempt to cross the border. Um, and at the same time, you have a situation to where, you know, those goods then now don't get into the market. So those market vendors are going to, you know, face challenges in having product on their shelves when people do come. So all of this starts to eventually filter through the economy, either in terms on the food side, or even just the broader consumer goods side in terms of the market as a whole. All right, thank you very much. Um, uh, Key, Dr. Park, I'd like to go back to uh, your statement. Uh, uh, the fact that North Korea has reached out to other countries uh, seeking assistance related to uh, COVID-19. And we, and you and we, you and myself and others are aware of a number of examples of this um, and specific requests that have been made. Um, it's fascinating. I find it fascinating, however, that North Korea, as far as, far as I know, the latest information I've heard, refuses to accept uh, COVID-19 related assistance from US NGOs who have offered this assistance. Now, uh, so wh why is this? Is it perhaps uh, a political statement by North Korea? Is it perhaps uh, an indication that China uh, has stepped up and North Korea knows that it can rely upon China in a major way, as well as Russia? Apparently both countries, as you're aware, have provided uh, testing kits uh, to North Korea. So uh, what is your uh, perspective on all this? Well, that's a great question. So they did ask for uh, help in mid-February to US NGOs, and you were aware of that. We were actually one of the organizations that were approached, uh, as well as international organizations like the UN agencies and international NGOs like the uh, IFRC, the Doctors Without Borders. And I think it's a matter of uh, a function of, of the barriers that the US NGOs have to go through versus the other organizations. We have extra layer of, of, of uh, hurdles for instance, U.S. Treasury. Uh, we have to first get permission from the U.S. Treasury, then the U.S. sanctions, exemptions. So there's a, there are a lot more steps involved. And I think the other organizations simply just got there first. Um, I don't think that the North Koreans would categorically reject assistance from North Korea, U.S. NGOs at this point, but I think they're, they got what they needed at the, at, and these other organizations got there quicker. I will tell you the Chinese and the Russians never went through the exemptions committee at the U.N. They just went ahead and sent the, uh, the, the, the test kits and, and medical supplies. And I can, the UN agencies are a little slower because they have to go through, they, they, they tend to go through the, the sanctions exemptions uh, process. And US NGOs obviously have a lot more to do uh, above and beyond that. So that's, that, that's what I think. All right, let's uh, shift for a moment, Key. Uh, tell Tell the audience a little bit about your own work in North Korea. When you go in, uh, you perform surgeries, correct? Uh, can you provide some uh, insight on your, your own personal experience? Sure, uh, so our first trip was in, in September of 2007. We didn't set our foot into the OR until April of 2008. Um, you know, in North Korea, when they say no initially, it doesn't mean no forever, right? They say it means initially no, means we're gonna check. And then we're going to see if we can trust you uh, before we can uh, you know, increase our relationship. But over the years, we've had uh, developed a fantastic relationship with the North Korean Medical Association. And we're now issued a, a, actually a license to practice our specialty in North Korea. Uh, and we work in multiple hospitals. We have a pediatric a neurosurgeon. He works at the Ongnyu Children's Hospital. Uh, I work at the Pyongyang Medical College uh, 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 Teaching Hospital and the Red Cross Hospital. 
And the surgeons in North Korea are fantastic. Um, they're like, you know, once you start working with them, we're on the same team. Even though technically I'm a U.S. citizen, we're at war with the North Koreans. Our enemy is not each other when we're taking care of a patient. Our enemy is the disease or the illness or the injury that the patient is, is suffering from. And we actually end up becoming one, one, one team. And it's, a, it's an amazing experience to work with them. They obviously deal with a, 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 a very difficult situation in, this, in terms of resources. They're a poor country, so they reuse just about everything. I think the sanctions have made things worse. Um, but it's been a, a, just an amazing experience getting to know and work with these North Korean surgeons. Very good, thank you. So Troy, uh, earlier I referenced the work of Chosen Exchange, the Singapore-based organization with which I believe you're somewhat familiar. Uh, Chosen Exchange uh, uh, through the years has trained about 3,000 or more uh, North Koreans on uh, how to become entrepreneurs. That's using the Chosen Exchange uh, phrasing. Um, I find it fascinating that uh, we have a few thousand individuals who've been trained on how to make money, how to start a business. And actually Chosen Exchange reports that there is keen competition for these training slots, that people desperately want to come and to learn. Um, I happened to be in Singapore one time when there was a group of 10 North Korean businesswomen uh, being trained by Chosen Exchange. And the, the particular day that I was there, these 10 businesswomen had traveled throughout Singapore, visiting retail outlets. They wanted to learn about pricing. Uh, they wanted to learn about displays, advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I approached one of the uh, women at the end of the day and said, so tell me, what, what is your project? And she said, well, I will be building uh, a shopping center in Pyongyang. And uh, my, my visit to Singapore has been very helpful in terms of, of uh, researching and discovering various uh, architectural uh, options. Now, Troy, in your mind, how does the leadership of North Korea reconcile, if you will, the fact that, they, that Kim Jong-un is allowing this sort of training, this type of education? At the same time, as you know, we're now, for a variety of reasons, seeing more of an emphasis on juche, on self-reliance, not to depend upon the outside. So in, based upon your analysis of North Korea over the years, how, how are these two almost opposing uh, uh, trends or ideas uh, how, in fact, are they reconciled by the leadership, do you think? I think it's often in tension. Um, you have a situation in North Korea to where the state-controlled system has largely broken down. Um, much of the economic activity, depending on, you know, whose estimate, and these are estimates because we don't have good data on this, that, you know, between 40 to 60 percent of the North Korean economy is essentially privatized and market to an extent. Now, there are caveats to this in that uh, most people who engage in economic activity need to have an affiliation with one of the state-run enterprises. Um, now, they may operate uh, somewhat independently, but they at least have to nominally have this type of affiliation. And so I think in the North Korean leadership's mind, one, um, it's a necessary evil, something that they need to allow to a certain extent for the country simply to move along. Um, I do think that there are views uh, to try and open this up more. Um, we've seen under Kim Jong-un an effort on trying to basically build economic growth. Um, you know, you can debate the success that he's had, um, uh, but, you know, this is an objective, this is, but you do often see the state hands starting to come back in. You know, about a year into or so into the latest UN sanctions, um, the state started taking more control back over what firms could export, what prices they could sell at, and these types of things. So you've seen uh, the state, after perhaps allowing more leeway, at times claw it back when it started to see the necessity. Um, so I think from the state's perspective, this is something that uh, complements perhaps what the state would like to do, but not something that they would like to acknowledge as marketization. Um, and, you know, there's also this sort of reluctance for even phrases like capitalism of Chinese characteristics. So I do think that there is this real tension between the desire to maintain a state-run economy, but allowing the market to sort of move forward and flourish. 
Thank you very much. Uh, Key, I'd like to return to the topic of COVID-19 in North Korea for a moment. Um, as you are aware, as we all now are fully aware, this coronavirus crisis is going to be with us for a while. And so uh, North Korea is facing similar challenges uh, as other countries in this regard. Uh, North Korea also has, as it's often stated, a, uh, a weakened healthcare system or a healthcare system that is not particularly strong, viable, and prepared to deal with what could occur in that country. So would you please walk us through in your mind, what are best case and worst case scenarios for North Korea uh, related to COVID-19? So yeah, that, let's just go through the best case scenario, which is they're able to maintain uh, uh, the virus uh, from coming in, prevent it from coming into the borders until there's effective medical treatment or vaccine. I think that's unrealistic, but it's a, if you say best case scenario, that's what I would give you. Let's talk about the worst case scenario. What happens if the virus uh, actually comes in and create, causes a, a major outbreak? So there's actually a modeling study that was done uh, by a group in the, um, in the UK, Imperial College, and then they looked at specifically all the uh, lower income countries and lower middle income countries, and North Korea is one of them. They estimated between uh, 7,000 to 150,000 North Korean people could die, and that's the range that they give. Uh, so the, at the low end, if they're really good at mitigating, like quarantining everyone, isolating, and then testing, uh, maybe 7,000 will be the, the minimum death. And, but that at the high end, as many as 150,000 people could die. So then that number, uh, I think, is important because it's not going to be millions of people if there's a major outbreak inside North Korea. It, it, it just won't be that way. What's important to remember is that does North Korea have the medical capacity to deal with the massive surge in patients like we saw in New York City. So if they're mitigate and they're able to flatten the curve, they're still going to have at its peak, at a minimum, they'll need about 13,000 beds. I think they do have that. But more importantly, 2,500 ICU beds. Now, when you talk about ICU beds, we're talking about ventilators uh, capable. And North Korea does not have anywhere near that number of ICU beds. And they know that. And, 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 and so they're trying to now uh, build up their capacity to treat through a couple of things. One is building up hospitals. And you saw this at the uh, reconstruction of the Pyongyang General Hospital in, in, in Pyongyang. And the other one is the oxygen generation uh, factory in North Hamgyong uh, province. It's no accident that they designed a medical oxygen plant because COVID-19 is a respiratory uh, illness and they need oxygen. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if they start figuring out how to manufacture their own ventilators at some point. Um, so they are building up their capacity uh, to treat uh, uh, in case of the worst case scenario. Thank you very much. And uh, I will come back to you a little later with another question related to uh, North Korea's healthcare system. Uh, but now uh, let's uh, return to Troy uh, and Troy, forgive me for uh, getting into the weeds here, uh, but uh, through the years, uh, I've discovered in my own research efforts that the bottom line question with information one receives is what is the truth? And uh, that, so that's an ongoing question. And, and then when I see you in your recent Diplomat article, your chart today, you, you are quoting Chinese trade data, all right? Uh, to what degree do you trust the integrity of this trade data? How, how do you, as an analyst, tear this apart? And, and how do you come up with, an, with uh, uh, your own thinking that, uh, in terms of what reality actually is? Yeah, no, this is a really great question because, you know, if we're being direct, you know, there are things that we know China does in terms of trade with North Korea that are not in its trade statistics. Um, you know, specifically, uh, China provides North Korea with uh, crude oil. Um, given the capacity of the pipeline between uh, China and North Korea, um, it most likely stays within uh, UN sanctions limits because basically uh, that UN sanction is pretty much set at what the estimated capacity of that pipeline given its age and corrosion likely is. Uh, but since 2013, or sorry, excuse me, 2013 was the last year 
that crude oil was in the trade data. So right there, I can tell you that the trade statistics aren't 100% accurate. Um, that being said, um, you know, this is sort of the best that we have to go with. So we have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, I think when you look at the data, one of the considerations is, are there things that you can do to sort of confirm or try to validate to an extent uh, whether things are going on? And so this gets back to the question of, you know, how effective sanctions have been. And so when we look at, say, uh, market price data by, you know, groups like Daily NK, who have people who send them out data uh, from three cities in North Korea, um, we've seen relative price stability, which suggests that goods are getting in. Now, we could question that data as well and say, you know, are they getting accurate data? Uh, and those types of things. And that is you know, clearly a challenge in all of this because, you know, we're trying to sort of validate one set of data, perhaps by using another set of data that has its own validation issues. But, you know, sort of looking more deeply, you know, one of the things that you start to come about also is that, you know, then you have the anecdotal side. You know, I mentioned Iran earlier. Um, when the sanctions went into place, you could see in reporting and other things shortages of consumer goods. Um, you know, their exchange rate is, you know, more publicly known in terms of what the actual rate is. You could see the exchange rate uh, significantly uh, drop against the U.S. dollar. So there's all of these sort of different things that you can see to kind of get what's going on. Now, when you ask at the end of the day how trustworthy it is, I think you do have to take it with a grain of salt. But at the end of the day, I think it's probably in an impressionistic sense, fairly accurate. Um, so, I mean, I do think that the border probably has been fairly well closed, but trade probably has not completely stopped because we do know that there are, as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, a 10 day quarantine phase for things coming in, but everything is moving much slower and there are probably fewer access points right now. So it's more mostly correct perhaps than completely correct. So Troy, you, you made reference to sanctions. Uh, talk to us for a moment, if you would, please, about what you view as the status of uh, sanctions enforcement by China. Uh, and you may also, in, in that context, uh, you might refer to the recent uh, panel of experts report, if you'd like. Yeah, and I mean, I think this is one of the challenges too, um, because when we look at things like smuggling, um, you know, there's satellite imagery of, and this is mostly prior to COVID-19, though I know at least one ship has left, I believe it was Nampo, uh, with suspected coal um, in the last couple of weeks or so. But there were multiple ships that had left uh, North Korea with coal. You see satellite imagery or intercepts of boats where there are ship-to-ship -ship transfers of oil. So oil, which has been restricted, has been flowing into North Korea. It's one reason why prices have been relatively stable, though there are periods where you do see spikes in gasoline in North Korea in the market data, suggesting perhaps that's periods where maybe the smuggling isn't quite as smooth as uh, it could be. Um, so the challenge becomes, you know, then, if you have the smuggling, who's engaging it? Is this something to where you have rogue actors in countries, or is it the Chinese government and the Russian government, you know, perhaps blessing this. I think the government involvement is harder to um, say, but there was a recent report by NK uh, News about um, essentially China importing North Korean goods, then re-exporting them to uh, other countries has Chinese goods, and also importing goods and then immediately re-exporting those. And the way they found this is that if you look at the customs data, in China, you would see the exact quantities either, say, of uh, wigs exported from North Korea and then shipped to, say, you know, maybe Italy, or you would see Italian wine come in, uh, perhaps, and then see that same amount of that type of wine going then to North Korea. Now, the challenge here with some of these things is, is while that's perhaps um, on the shady side of things to do things, um, many of these goods aren't prohibited by UN sanctions. Um, Luxury goods, except for a few items, are defined by the countries. Um, so my guess is that China probably does not consider wine, for example, to be a luxury good. So you have some things that are sort of on the skirting of the law, perhaps. And then you have these other items uh, like coal and oil, which are largely being smuggled at high rates. And you mentioned the UN Panel of Experts report. 
to where they estimated through September or August of this past year that uh, North Korea earned $370 million from coal exports. The challenge with that, I think, is, is that the estimate basically suggests as well that North Korea is basically earning market rates or close to market rates for its coal exports. You know, I think that's probably not the case, but I think this is a challenge that even when we have satellite imagery, you have to estimate how much coal is actually in the uh, ship. And then you have to also try and estimate how much North Korea is actually earning for that. So we know what's going on. We can tell it's fairly robust, but even there, it's hard to know for certain. All right, Troy, thank you. And I'd also like to uh, remind uh, uh, those who are watching uh, that you certainly may uh, submit a question uh, to one of our panelists. Uh, in that regard, uh, Dr. Park, we have a question from James Men. He said, uh, I've heard that even healthcare in North Korea has marketized where incentives have to be given to doctors to get medical care. What have you heard or seen uh, in this regard? He so I have, not, yeah, I have not seen uh, this uh, personally, uh, but I would not be surprised if it's going on. I mean, I've worked in Ethiopia and Cambodia. I've actually lived in Cambodia for three years. And even the doctors in the public hospitals, because they don't get paid living wages, they were getting paid $160 a month as a salary. It's not enough. And so there's an expectation that, that, that they will be charging extra to the patients to get the additional services, for instance, you know, at least move ahead of the line. So these are, uh, this is a phenomenon we see in most lower and middle income countries uh, with public health systems. Uh, where people with means will actually give additional uh, um, uh, you know, gifts and things like that to get, you know, get, the, uh, to get better service. But personally, I've not seen this uh, uh, inside North Korea, but then again, I'm not sure if uh, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So during your trips to North Korea, am I correct that you spend most of your time in Pyongyang? Uh, and so my question is, what is your assessment of the quality of healthcare outside of Pyongyang and the rest of North Korea compared to the health care received by the elites who reside in Pyongyang? Well, so you're right. Uh, I am seeing only patients inside the Pyongyang hospitals. However, I will tell you I've had patients that have been referred in from the outside uh, surrounding uh, uh, provinces. And one, one, one gentleman was a factory worker from the Kangwon province and he had been transferred over to the Pyongyang hospitals. And he wasn't a VIP or an elite for sure. So, you know, there is a system for patients to be transferred onward. But I will tell you, the, uh, and I don't have direct uh, hands-on experience in working in these provincial hospitals or district-level hospitals, but the, 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 the piece of information that I think is most helpful to try to understand the urban, urban rural uh, disparities is the UNICEF uh, survey that they conducted at the end of 2017 that shows a clear disparity in the, in the level of stunting. In Pyongyang, it's maybe one in five children are stunted. But if you go out to some of the poorer provinces, uh, maybe one in three are stunted. So there, there, there clearly are uh, disparities. All right, we now have um, a question uh, from an anonymous attendee, and I'll direct this uh, to Troy. Um, Troy, what do you anticipate happening when Kim Jong-un leaves his role as leader, however and whenever that may be? Will there merely be a new leader installed, or will there be fundamental changes for North Korea? I think there's two ways to look at this question. Um, one, in the sense of that I think you will see a new leader. Um, this is a regime that um, you know, is very well organized, you know, thinks through these issues. I would expect, you know, for you know, argument's sake, let's say that you know, this recent rumor of Kim Jong-un had been true, that the leadership would have come together, sought to take and iron out the differences before making a public announcement you know, whether that had been, you know, um, his sister, who was speculated, Kim Yo-jung, uh, whether it had been uh, some other individual, but that there would be a plan in place. Now, obviously, circumstances could change that, but I would expect, you know, that Kim Jong-un would not necessarily be the end of North Korea. And I think we shouldn't work off the premise that, you know, he would lead to, you know, the state falling apart. Um, that being said, um, change can mean things other than simply the regime itself disappearing. Um, if you look at Kim Jong-un himself, he in his own time in power has de-emphasized the military, even if he's advanced the nuclear weapons program more and tried to raise the profile of the party itself. 
he's placed more emphasis on the economy than his father did. So you can have policy change within a new leader, whoever that might be. At the same time, if we're talking about these bigger issues, uh, new leadership also opens up the opportunity for broader directions as well. Um, I've been recently working on a project and looking at you know, sanctions and that it's often easier, and this isn't surprising, for a new leader to make a change that uh, you know, allows for sanctions to be lifted. That doesn't necessarily mean it'll be the case in North Korea. This is a slightly more complex case than many of the others that have been examined in the past, but it would create potentially an opportunity. But I also, the last thing I would say is that anytime you have a new leadership, there is also from some of the other research I've done, you know, a period of about seven to eight years to where the regime is really sort of trying to take and reassert its authority and establish itself. And that can be the most uncertain period for them. And once they get past that, uh, generally speaking, it tends to be fairly stable. All right, a question that I would like to direct to both of you. Um, and if you could, you might uh, summarize your your answers as briefly as possible. We have some other questions waiting. Um, let's talk about South Korea and North Korea, this, the, the North-South interaction, the North-South relationship. Let's talk about that in the context of COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Park, talk to us in terms of what you see as possible or not regarding potential assistance to North Korea, according to what occurs within that country by the South. Um, in addition, uh, you will both recall that uh, months ago, North Korea rejected an offer of 50,000 tons of rice from South Korea. Having said that, we know that COVID-19 related, uh, some in North Korea have been reaching out to South Korean NGOs uh, for assistance. So let's talk about this, the North-South dynamic, uh, how COVID-19 uh, may impact that. So uh, let's start with Keith. Right. So food security and, and, and the pandemic are different. One is a, a humanitarian crisis, but the other one is a, a global health security threat, a non-traditional security threat. And the, and the dynamics of, of, of countries helping one another are totally different and, and, and countries see it differently. For instance, of, of food insecurity, many people, many countries see it as a squarely a, a North Korean problem. It's their government uh, as decision to solve and, and problem to solve. But a, a, a situation like the COVID-19, it's a global pandemic and a, a, a success in containing this is as good as you know, the weakest link. So we all have to help one another. I think this is why the, the US reached out uh, um, in February, at least publicly saying we, we, we're concerned about the people of North Korea uh, with the COVID-19. And, and, and U.S. has softened up their, their humanitarian exemptions process uh, in the context of COVID-19. They're actually doing what they say they're going to do. Now, South Korea, you know, so here's a couple of things that, that happened. North, North Koreans actually sent the letter, Kim Jong-un sent the letter to President Moon in early March, you know, expressing concern. Now, prior to that, there was very little activity going on between North and South Korea. With that letter, there was something must have transpired because now you have a South Korean NGO or NGOs that are able to deliver assistance and the North Koreans are accepting that aid. At least this is a COVID-19 assistance, not food. This is a very important point because it now shows that there's cooperation happening and they can build on this over time. I think South Korea at the same time should use their current um, uh, uh, Diplomatic capital, if you will, uh, with the with the with the uh, their handling of the COVID nineteen situation because they're one of the top performers, and the fact that they got this right with Kim Jong Un being disappeared you know, when he disappeared, they came out and said he's alive, he's fine, and they were right. South Korea is 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 actually uh, is doing quite well uh, diplomatically from a, uh, an international reputation. They're swinging above their weight. And I think they should use that at this point to, uh, to try to work on the sanctions, number one, and number two, increase the humanitarian corridor and actually develop a, a spearhead and, and, and be a, play a leadership role in, in developing a coalition uh, that could potentially open up uh, opportunities to, to roll back some of the sanctions. Thank you, Keith. Troy? Well. You know, I think one of the ways to view this situation is, is that, you know, as Key said, 
you know, the COVID-19 situation is different from the humanitarian situation and the other situations. So I do think there is an opportunity there, especially if North Korea is open to it. But I think, you know, South Korea needs to maybe try to be creative here. You know, if you take and, you know, if North Korea won't accept food aid, you know, why not try and see, you know, can you send, you know, sanitation wipes or Purell or these kinds of things, things that might help stop the spread of disease, things that we should have maybe a reasonable degree of certainty that the North Koreans would distribute more widely and not necessarily amongst the elite, because even if, you know, they are cleaning their hands and the disease continues to spread throughout North Korea, they themselves are at risk. So you need to try and take, you know, in all parts of the population, take and address the issue. So I think, you know, there is an opportunity here if South Korea, you know, tries to continue to engage, but maybe try to be creative and look for things that one, um, you know, you have a good certainty that would actually reach the people in the countryside and the other cities beyond Pyongyang, but also the types of things that, you know, really would help address the situation. And, you know, part of that might even be telling North Korea, because at the end of the day, um, if there's ventilators North Korea or South Korea can send that, you know, if you need them, we have some we can send you. Uh, just let us know and taking those types of steps. So Troy, let's let's take this another step uh, when we discuss uh, inter-Korean cooperation. Uh, at what point uh, would inter-Korean cooperation, uh, COVID-19 related or whatever, at, at what point does that uh, start touching on the U.S. ROK alliance, our agreement, our understanding between the U.S. and the ROK? So, you know, I think on the humanitarian side of COVID-19, there's a common mutual interest between the United States and South Korea. And, you know, as Key mentioned, the Trump administration has reached out to North Korea as well. So I don't think that there's a challenge there. Um, the U.S. has also been supportive of some types of inter-Korean engagement. So, for example, um, doing surveys of the North Korean rail and roads to prepare, you know, the possibility of repairing and reconnecting these to South Korea. So you have these types of situations. Um, you know, humanitarian aid, I don't think necessarily steps on uh, the alliance. I think the situation starts becoming more difficult when we start talking about things like reopening the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Um, you know, this is in the negotiations of the nuclear weapons program, perhaps one of the larger, um, you know, exemptions that could be created for, you know, progress in that process. So I think when you start talking about things like Kaesong, so the United States is probably going to want to see some type of progress on the nuclear front. But I think, you know, sort of before that, um, there's opportunities. And some of these are things that we haven't even discussed before, such as, you know, perhaps North Korea doesn't have good ability to simply track the weather. So, you know, information sharing on the weather, be it either through providing more information um, to the North Korean government, which might necessarily not get out to the broader public, or even perhaps creating some type of weather app, which should have no objections, uh, you know, between the U.S. and South Korea that might provide data that would help, you know, for say, example, farmers better know how to take and manage their crops because they have better weather information. So I think there's also some creative things on the digital side that we might could do as well. All right, I have a final question uh, for each of you, uh, a wrap-up question, and then uh, if you have additional comments you'd like to share uh, before we conclude, please do so. The question is, uh, if the opportunity presented itself, should President Trump have another summit uh, with Kim Jong-un? Key, you get to go first. Well, yeah, absolutely. There's nothing, no harm in, in, in talking. I, I want to revisit this. this uh, you, you brought up the U.S.-South -Korea, Korea alliance issue. And as an observer, uh, I see that as uh, U.S. sort of providing the little military protection of South Korea uh, for exchange for South Korea doing whatever the U.S. tells them to do, you know, or checking with the U.S. on everything they want to do. And it's been frustrating for me to watch. You know, South Korea has yet to uh, uh, provide a substantial amount of funding to the U.N. agencies for their needs and priorities for North Korea. It's gone chronically underfunded. They ask for typically between 100 to $120 million a year. And this is for the most vulnerable population in North Korea. Where's South Korea? You know, they have the money. It's $100 million. It's, it's not a lot of money, uh, but they've been reluctant. I think they want to, but because of U.S.'s position saying, hey, you know, we're, we're still applying maximum pressure on North, North Korea. 
And South Korea, you know, there's, there's also a difference in the objectives. From the U.S. side, it's denuclearization seems to be their primary objective. But from the South Korea side, that's a secondary objective. The first primary objective is establishment of a peace regime. And they want to get there through engagement, while the U.S. wants to get there through maximum pressure. There has to be a split somewhere in the two strategies. They can't, be, they can't coexist. And now with the South Korean president, he's got two years left in his presidency. His, his ruling party has swept the, uh, the parliamentary elections. I'd like to see them take some, 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 some steps, some concrete steps, and, and, and really uh, uh, develop, uh, make some concrete steps towards uh, establishing inter-Korea relations and, and then also driving the international diplomatic process uh, for peace. All right, Troy, final comments? On the summit, I am of a slightly different perspective. Um, I don't think actually the North Koreans, if there wasn't a real reason for this summit, would want to move forward. So I think it depends on the context and what the two leaders are discussing or have agreed. Um, I would say if there is progress that can be made at the summit, we should be willing to meet. Um, but I don't think we should just simply meet for the sake of meeting. And I think even the North Koreans would find that to be disappointing. So I do think you know, the idea of a summit should be, you know, sort of caveated in terms of the context of what is hoping to be achieved. You know, I think more broadly, when we look at the situation, you know, North Korea is a complex issue, one to which we lack good information. And we need to try and find creative ways to deal with North Korea, both be that through the inter-Korean process, be that through the United States. But that also means, though, that we need cooperation and help from China and Russia, because if China and Russia are taking activities that, you know, inhibit the ability of the United States and South Korea to make progress with North Korea, then it makes it difficult, I think, for us to try and build those relations. But I also think in terms of building those relations, we need to sort of look beyond some of the things we've done in the past. You know, we often when we talk about, you know, engagement, we'll discuss things like, well, the exchange of sporting teams or the exchange of uh, symphony orchestras, these types of things, or joining the Olympics as a joint inter-Korean team. You know, those things have all played a positive role, but I think we need to try and start looking for types of engagement on a person-to-person -person level that can be more sustainable to try and shape and begin reshaping attitudes, you know, not just in North Korea, but even to try and find a way for North Koreans to get to know Americans better so that way Americans can be more trustful of North Koreans as well. So I think we need to try and look at that direction. Thank you, Troy. Uh, thank you, Key. You know, we, our discussion uh, to a large extent has focused on the bilateral context of the U.S. and North Korea. And I, I think it's important today to also uh, commend the efforts of the United Nations, uh, sometimes very quietly, to, to be helpful on the North Korea issue. There is a lot of energy and effort going into this, and I believe that uh, it has been productive along the way. Prior to the COVID-19 crisis, uh, North Korea uh, that had expressed willingness to participate in at least three uh, track two projects around the world. And uh, it's my understanding now that uh, North Korea has signaled again its willingness to participate in these track two efforts, uh, which I believe is a positive sign uh, on their part. Um, and so I would like to conclude my own remarks uh, with that. Uh, if you have, uh, for the audience, if you have more, if you would like to have more information on uh, either of our speakers, um, Key Park, uh, I would suggest you Google Key Park Harvard or follow Key on Twitter. Uh, for Troy Stangerone, you can go to the KEI website. Uh, Troy often writes as well for The Diplomat. Uh, he has a column uh, in the Korea Times also. Um, with that, uh, again, thank you, Courtney, on behalf of NCNK for the privilege of being a part of this discussion. And I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Keith, for doing a terrific job moderating Troy and Dr. Park. Uh, that was fantastic. I think, you know, from, from the get-go, I learned a lot and it, and it never let up. Um, and, and just to follow up on your remarks, Keith, um, for more information, um, I would like to direct everyone who's listening to, to the National Committee on North Korea, as you have a lot of tremendous resources as well. So um, please do. Please do check that out. Um, so thank you all for, for participating tonight. Um, just a, a note to those who are listening, we do have um, 
a few briefings coming up next week. Um, on Monday at noon, we have uh, a panel on um, international cyber conflict, and it, it's looking to be great. We have Ambassador Milica Pejanovic Juricic, who is the Montenegrin ambassador to the UN and who is the Minister of Defense at the time of Montenegro's NATO accession. Uh, we have the retired Major General Brett Williams, who is this uh, COO and co-founder of IronNet Cybersecurity, and uh, Jay Healy, who is at Columbia and well, I, I want to say he, he, he wrote the book on cyber conflict. He basically edited the first book on cyber conflict. Um, and it will be moderated by Tom Yohannan, who works in writes about um, cyber issues. So that should be a terrific panel. That's Monday at noon. Again, this is open to all. Um, we also have a program on Thursday with uh, Brett Grusman of the Environmental Defense Fund on whether or not uh, the uh, the economic recovery from COVID-19, what the environmental impacts will be. Will it be a green or gray recovery? So that will should be an interesting discussion. And for those of you who missed part of this or want to tell more about it, this we'll post this on our YouTube channel. So please subscribe. Please um, you know you can, there's a lot of information in here. So this wasn't your only shot to get it. So please, you know, go back and listen again. Um, and, and thank you all. Have a wonderful evening and um, we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.